Humans are what we call eukaryotic organisms, and what that means is we consist of many, many, many individual cells. Now, for the human to actually function correctly, the individual cells must be able to work together and they must be able to communicate with one another. And on top of that, these individual cells must be able to carry out the processes at the correct time. And the question is, how does a given cell actually know to carry out a specific set of processes at a given time? So to demonstrate what I mean by that, let's imagine the following scenario. And we're going to use this scenario as we go along this lecture. So let's, suppo let's suppose I'm walking in the national park and I come across a bear and that bear happens to be hungry. Now, if the bear is that size, I'm clearly not gonna run away. But if the bear is a large bear and if I panic, I'm going to run. Now, when I run, what happens inside my body? Well, somehow, my cells know to generate more ATP molecules because the skeletal muscle and the cardiac muscle will need those ATP molecules to basically increase the rate of contraction. So, for instance, the heart will be able to pump more blood and the rate at which the heart actually pumps the blood to the tissues will increase as a result of those ATP molecules. Now, the question is, how do the cells know to basically begin carrying out these processes? Well, the short answer is the cells actually respond to changes in the chemicals, in the molecules that exist on the outside of the cell. And these chemicals, these molecules can actually influence the processes that the cells carry out. And these processes ultimately lead to physiological responses such as running away from that hungry bear. So chemical changes in the environment around cells can influence the cells to carry out processes that ultimately lead to specific physiological responses. Now beginning with that signal molecule that increases in concentration around that cell and ending all the way with that physiological response, all the events that take place between these two points of time, this is what we call a signal transduction pathway. Transduction simply means we're passing down that, we're passing down that signal from one area to another area. And we'll see exactly what that means in just a moment. So uh, to go back to our bear example, when we see that bear, we panic and we begin running. What happens is, or one of the things that begins happening is, the endocrine system, and more specifically, the adrenal gland found on top of the kidneys begins producing a specific type of signal molecule we call epinephrine. Epinephrine diffuses into the bloodstream, then goes around the cells, and so the concentration of, of epinephrine around the cells increases, and that ultimately influences the cells to carry out specific types of processes that lead to that physiological response of running away. Now, epinephrine is not the only example of this signal a molecule that initiates the signal transduction pathway. We have many, many other examples and two other examples that we're going to study in detail in the lectures to come are insulin and the epidermal growth factor. But we have many other examples. For instance, other hormones are also these signal molecules. Now, what I'd like to do in this lecture is generalize the steps of the signal transduction pathway. So how does this pathway actually take place? <clears throat> Let's begin with step number one. So I see the bear, I panic, and I begin to run. And at that moment, what happens is the adrenal gland begins releasing that epinephrine. So I have some stimulus. The stimulus is that hungry bear. And so that stimulus induces the release of that particular signal molecule. And this signal molecule is known as the primary messenger molecule. So step number one is the release of the appropriate primary messenger molecule as a result of some type of external stimulus. Step number two is, now that the epinephrine is released, it travels through the bloodstream. Eventually, it diffuses into the extracellular matrix around the cells and then it binds onto specific receptor transmembrane proteins found on the membranes of those cells. So 
The primary messenger locates and attaches onto a receptor which are usually transmembrane proteins. These receptors have an extracellular component found outside the cell and an intracellular component found inside the cell. And that ligand, that primary messenger shown in red, actually binds onto the outside portion of that transmembrane protein, the receptor. So this is the membrane, the outside of the cell, the inside of the cell. And notice that this ligand, the primary messenger, binds onto this region on the outside. And once it binds, it creates a conformational change that in some cases basically causes a portion of that protein on the intracellular side to basically detach. And that can lead to other processes, as we'll see in lectures to come. So this is basically step number two, the formation of that receptor, primary messenger, or ligand complex is what we call step two. And what happens in step two is that message <coughs> that is stored in that primary messenger is now transduced, passed down, to that cell. Now that the binding took place, the cell knows to carry out specific types of processes. So what happens next is the following, step three. And in step three, as a result of this process, that cell begins to increase the concentration of some type of molecule found inside the cell. Some type of intracellular molecule we call the secondary messenger. So once the information is, is a passed down, transduced across the cell membrane, so once step two takes place, the cell reacts by increasing the production of some sort of intracellular molecule called a secondary messenger. So for instance, one example of a secondary messenger is cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Another example of, is a calcium, and we have many other examples that we're going to look at. Now, the important part about step three is it creates an amplification of that signal. Why? And what is that? Well, normally, we have a low concentration of that primary messenger. We can have as low as a single molecule that binds onto that receptor, onto that transmembrane protein. And even though we only have this single primary messenger, what happens inside the cell is we produce many of these intracellular secondary messengers. And then they can basically go on to carry out their individual processes and this greatly amplifies the overall effect of this information. So we see that these secondary messengers, this step basically amplifies that signal. Now, once secondary messengers are produced, they can easily diffuse across that cell. So they can enter other organelles such as the nucleus or the mitochondria or so forth. So secondary messengers are free to move or diffuse around the cell. This means that they can go on and influence processes within different compartments of that cell. So once again, we can have two of the same uh, secondary messengers go on to different places in that cell and basically influence different processes and that could amplify the effect of that signal. Let's move on to four, activation or in some cases inhibition of effectors. So what exactly is an effector? An effector is some type of molecule. It could be an enzyme, it could be a protein pump, it could be a membrane channel, or it can be some type of trans uh, transcription inducing molecule. So basically these effectors are actually themselves responsible for carrying out some type of specific process that, that takes place inside the body. And all of these processes basically work together to carry out that specific physiological response. So effectors are molecules that are responsible for carrying out some type of cellular process that ultimately leads to that physiological response. And effectors can be transcription-inducing molecules, enzymes, we have membrane pumps, we have membrane channels, and so forth. So for instance, 
when we'll discuss insulin, we'll see that what insulin does is it increases the rate at which we uptake glucose molecules into the cell. And what that does is that means it influences the cells to produce many more of these protein molecules that can actually uptake the glucose molecules. And that might involve the process of gene expression, so transcription of those proteins, the pumps, that eventually are placed into the membrane of the cell to actually uptake the glucose molecules. Now, the final step in this signal transduction pathway is to actually terminate that pathway. It's very important that we terminate a pathway at the proper time because if we can't terminate a pathway, that can lead to very negative detrimental effects as we'll see in a lecture to come. Basically, in some cases, certain cancers are actually a result of the inability of our body to effectively terminate signal transduction pathways.